This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. This is Making Leadership Work on Think Tech, and I'm your host, Carol Mon Lee. Today, my guest is Brenda Kotanda, who is a lawyer from Philadelphia, who's moved here from uh, Philadelphia to Hawaii last year. And the name of our show today is called Cr Cross Country Law Practice is the Way of the Future. So welcome, Brenda. Thank you, Carol. Happy to be here. Oh, great. So now tell us again, tell me and tell our audience why you moved to Hawaii a year ago. Sure. We came here because my husband, who um, originally grew up here in Hawaii, went to school in Hawaii, but has been on the mainland, was offered position as president of Hawaii Pacific University. So we made the big trip, packed up the whole family, um, and moved out to Hawaii. And we're very, very happy with the move. Great. So it's you, your husband, John, your mm -hmm. two children, and your dog, right? Yes. yes. Right. Uh-huh. Great. Right. Well, welcome. <laughs> Thank um, you. So we're going to talk about cross-country law practice because you are a partner in the law firm of Manco, Gold, Catcher, Fox uh, in the Philadelphia region. That's right. right. And uh, so tell us why you decided to stay in the law practice there and instead of moving to Hawaii and maybe starting out a different right. uh, type of career or law practice. Right. Well, I've been with the firm for over 20 years and um, actually joined the firm one year out of law school. Um, and it's a terrific firm. And um, I really do terrific work with the firm. So my partners are very supportive. Um, and I have clients that present challenging environmental issues. We're an environmental and energy law practice. And so I really didn't want to leave it because I love what I do and I love who I work with. And so rather than leaving them to join a firm here, we um, set up this arrangement so that I could work long distance. And it's, you know, we've been doing it now for a while since I moved and it's been working just, just awesomely. Great. So let's, let's find out a little bit more about your firm. So about how many lawyers do you have? Mm -hmm. So we have 30 lawyers, all practicing environmental and energy law. It's actually environmental health and safety, energy, and sustainability. And we have three technical consultants on staff as well. So we offer a multidisciplinary practice to our clients. Oftentimes, environmental legal issues have complicated technical aspects. And so we can bring to bear on the legal issues technical input, because sometimes it's more cost effective to solve a complicated legal issue with a change in perhaps the technology. Maybe there's somebody who's got a wastewater treatment plant, and it's a very difficult for them to meet a particular water quality standard, but there's a different uh, technical approach that they could take that could solve the problem. I see. So is this a growing practice uh, of law in Philadelphia and, and maybe nationwide? So we've certainly been growing. Our firm was formed in 1989, and at the time, I think we started out with maybe 10 lawyers, and we're now at 30. Never had the intention to grow just for the sake of growing, but our number of clients has grown, our business has grown, and so as that's happened, um, our firm has evolved and, and grown with it as well. Was that your specialty in, in law school? Did you get a certificate in environmental law, or did you always have an interest in this area? So I went to the University of Texas at Austin. There was no certificate in environmental law available, but I knew I wanted to practice environmental law when I started. So I was able to take environmental law classes while I was in law school, and, um, and in fact worked with some environmental lawyers in Texas before moving back to the East Coast. I see. And um, on your business card, it has a couple of letters that I don't usually see after Brenda Quatanda Esquire. Lead AP, L-E-E-D-A-P. Tell us what that okay. means. So I, I lead our firm's sustainability law practice. And one of the things that we address is green building, green leasing, green practices, and things like that. So the U.S. Green Building Council has a program called LEAD, stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And, and that's they, L E E D. That's L E E D, that's right. And they certify buildings that have sustainable um, construction and operating practices, so green buildings. And they have a professional accreditation that you can pursue. It involves learning about all of the green practices and then taking an exam. So, kind of like a bar exam, only for green buildings. I see. Is it a very selective group of people who have this designation? 
Many of the people are in the construction industry and in the development industry, but I went ahead and did it because I have a lot of clients that um, build green buildings, manage green buildings, and I thought it was really important to have that in order to be able to most effectively counsel them on legal matters involving green issues and sustainability, how they might address the issue in leases to ensure that the buildings were operated in a fashion to have a certification maintain it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So are there other attorneys in your firm with the same designation? So there is one of our technical consultants has it, but I'm the only one that has the, the lead AP among the legal staff. Nice. So tell us a little bit about your clients. You mentioned your clients and what you do for them. Sure. In general. I know you okay. can't disclose <laughs> right. names. So we handle um, complicated, cutting edge legal matters in environmental health and safety. And we also handle day-to-day -day compliance and transactions. So our clients range from industrial manufacturers to developers, to healthcare facilities, um, transportation, railroad, retail, almost any business that you can think of typically encounters some environmental issue in what it is they do, whether they are manufacturing something and so therefore may need a permit to discharge wastewater after treatment or perhaps they're building a building and looking at redeveloping a site that has some contamination on it and so therefore wants to clean up that contamination and put it back into reuse. So it's mostly corporate clients, sometimes individuals because even individuals can experience perhaps a spill that needs to be remediated, um, you know, buying and selling properties, compliance counseling and transactions. So are your clients mostly in the Philadelphia area? So we have clients in that region, but also nationally and internationally. Um, sometimes we uh, are working for a client that has an issue in the Philadelphia region, and that's how we first get involved with them. But then the relationship develops, and they've got an issue in Europe, or they've got an issue in South America. And you know they want to handle things in a certain way to make sure that it complies with not only their own policies, but then laws elsewhere. And while we may not be expert in international laws, we can give them you know, what a standard of care would be here in the States. I see. Do you have clients here in Hawaii? So um, I am developing a Hawaii practice and uh, have passed the bar, member of the Hawaii bar. Congratulations. And so you have the, the office yeah. is now a That's Hawaii right. office, too. That's right, exactly. And I'm trying to get involved in the community to mm -hmm. meet people and to develop our practice. Mm -hmm. So I've uh, joined the environmental section of the bar, and I'll be an officer this year for programs. Great. Um, and then I'm getting uh, also involved in other things, because it's really important, I think, to give back to the community um, as a starting point. Of course. So let's talk about um, how you manage, then, uh, having a very vibrant interesting law practice in Philadelphia area and living 5,000 miles away here in Hawaii. So how, what kind of a challenge is that and how do you actually manage it? Well, um, I'll tell you there's, there's a, some key components to managing it. I think you need to have a supportive firm, supportive clients. You have to have a certain type of personality and a certain type of practice. So as far as the firm is concerned, my firm is terrific. They've been so supportive in that they've, in fact, they suggested that I continue to work after I left. Um, we believe, my firm believes in work-life balance and in diversity and providing a supportive work environment. So a third of our partners are women. Um, about half of them are on a part-time schedule. So this idea really wasn't that radical to them. Uh, we're connected very easily with the technology. When I log into my computer system here in Hawaii, it's as if I'm sitting there in Pennsylvania. Of course, so, time difference, right? Of course, the time difference, right. So we manage that. How do you manage the time difference? Um, so we're about five or six hours different. Mm -hmm. And um, I've said to all of my clients and all of my partners and colleagues, if you need me up for a 9 o'clock call on the East Coast, I'm there. And I'll get up in the middle of the night. It's not a problem. <laughs> 3 a.m. here. <laughs> That's right. But all of them, they, you know, they would rather have me fresh and alert. And so they try to schedule calls and meetings in the afternoon, principally. And so I start work here around 6.30 AM, so as to catch the full balance of the afternoon. And then I can actually work into their evening, because it's just the daytime here for me. So that's worked out very well. Um, but I guess I'd say the other thing, too, is it's really important to have a certain um, practice and personality. So a lot of my practice 
involves work over the telephone, talking to clients, talking to regulators, emailing when we're doing um, transactions, buying and selling property, or trying to work out permitting issues. A lot of it involves um, communication over the internet, email. So that really is key to this. And the other thing is to really be a person that has a lot of initiative, right? So I've got a track record with the firm. I'm very proactive. I try to think of issues before they arise and then address it, make a plan for you know when this is going to come up, how are we going to address it. Do you use Skype? You do. We do. We have mm -hmm. Skype for business. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have partners meeting on a monthly basis. So I will Skype in for that. So I'm present on video conference, sitting around the table while everybody's eating lunch. I'm eating breakfast. Um, so that works just fine. <laughs> so how often do you travel back to the mainland to see your firm or meet so clients? In the past year, I've been back um, two or three times. And uh, the funny thing is, is I, you know, when I was practicing there, I wouldn't necessarily reach out just to meet with a client, just for the sake of meeting with the clients. Because they're always I, there. They're there, and I figure they're busy, and let's just get our work done. But now that I'm going back and it's a deliberate trip, I call and contact them. So I'm seeing my clients, I think, far more than I ever had um, because of the nature of, of how I'm organizing my visits. Did you experience any pushback when you were telling your clients you were moving to Hawaii? And um, were they concerned about the responsiveness or the uh, ability to I think the responsiveness is key. They weren't concerned about it because I've got a track record with them for being responsive. So, you know, when they send an email, they expect a prompt response. And um, as long as you're responsive and you're flexible, I've not had any problem or any client, uh, you know, say that this wasn't going to work. Quite the contrary. Great. So, it's uh, part of your practice uh, on the mainland. Do you find that uh, you're able to keep up with the developments in the law, uh, both statewide in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, and also nationwide, and then perhaps what's going on here in Hawaii? I, I do. And part of it is because there is so much information that's available electronically now in terms of you know, reporters and business journals. And so I still subscribe to all of those. So I'm getting the local news. We have actually offices in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So I'm you know, still keeping current with Pennsylvania and New Jersey legal matters. And our 30 lawyers in our firm work together collectively. So when somebody sees a new legal issue, shoots out an email to the whole firm. So it's not as though I feel like I'm missing anything because of the way we practice. We all help one another to keep current with issues. So the current um, administration, Trump administration, and the changes in the uh, Environmental Protection Agency and related areas. How has that affected your practice? I think a lot of people have uncertainty. So given that, they're reaching out to their lawyers to try to anticipate what's to come. It's a little hard to anticipate it given the nature of how things have been rolling out, but we're certainly staying on top of regulatory changes. What does it mean if you remove a particular rule? Because just because somebody is deregulating, it doesn't affect all clients the same way. And for some, it might be beneficial to them, and others, it might not be beneficial. So we continue to have to you know, help clients work through these issues and determine what it means to them for their own operations. Because a lot of what we do is compliance counseling. How do you comply? What do you do? What systems do you put in place to make sure that you're meeting the regulatory requirements? Is there one particular uh, deregulation or issue that is of um, particular concern? Across the board to all clients? Not really, because we represent such diverse sectors. Uh -huh. So, um, And I guess the same answer for anything that might be positive. That's or, right. Yeah. That's right. It, it really... It really depends upon what they're doing. As I said, you know, we have folks that are developing real estate or that are um, pursuing new energy projects, right? And there's a new tariff on solar, right? So for those that are pursuing solar, perhaps that um, you know could be a bit of a challenge to them. Um, though I've also heard some people say they don't think it'll impact quite as negatively as some of the press is saying, at least for some of the projects that are happening in in the Philadelphia region. So. Okay. Well, great. On that note, we're going to take a short break and 
I'm here with my guest, Brenda Gotanda, a lawyer from the Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area who's now living in Hawaii and practicing law 5,000 miles away. We'll be right back with Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee with uh, Making Leadership Work and my guest, Brenda Kotanda. Welcome, yeah. Brenda. Um, I want to have everybody look at this wonderful backdrop picture that we have, which is we are sitting in the middle of your reception area. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> your law firm, Manco, Gold, Catcher, and Fox. That's right. Uh, in Philadelphia area. So we have some wonderful slides. And tell us, Brenda, your role in how the firm and the reception area is using your particular areas of expertise to develop a not just beautiful, but functional and environmentally um, positive Thank you. Statement. Thank you. I'd be happy to. So <clears throat> as an environmental and energy law firm, we're not only dedicated to providing high quality legal services to our clients, but being responsible stewards to the environment. So when we needed to make a move for um, purposes of getting larger office space because we were growing, we actually moved um, from one floor to a higher floor in our building where there was more space available. And we wanted to do it in a way that was in sensitive to the environment and take steps to design and construct the space in a sustainable manner. So what we did is we used the US Green Building Council LEED certification as a guide in our design and construction. And in doing so, um, we were able to become the first law firm in the Philadelphia region that achieved a LEED Gold certification for its interior fit out. So, and I'd be happy to show some of the things that yeah, we did in order to do that. Yeah, okay, so now we're looking at a slide that has a picture of three different pictures. So tell us how. Right. Um, so this is one example of the things that we did when we were Doing the construction, we made sure that the, there was a, an indoor environmental quality management plan that was in, used during construction to make sure that once we were fully constructed, we didn't have a lot of residual chemicals and, and such in the space. Mm -hmm. We used low VOC paints, sealants. VOC. A, a volatile organic compounds. Okay. So you know when you get a new carpet, it's that new carpet smell that you sometimes right. smell. But there's carpets now that you can get and adhesives and paints that don't use the VOCs. And so it's better for the environment, better indoor air quality. So your floor and your reception area, is that carpeting? So that actually is um, stonework. See the background ah. of this uh, slide here, material uh -huh. and resources, that's a picture of the stonework. The and background, the beige color the beige. is the stonework, right? right and the right. blue is carpeting? And the blue is carpeting. Okay. And in this particular uh, photo here, you can see the coffee table in our reception area. That's a really beautiful coffee table. It looks like a uh, work of art, a building. <laughs> Well, that thank is pushed you. On its side. <laughs> and and one of the terrific aspects of it is that it is made of reclaimed timber, locally sourced. So old buildings that were torn down, mm -hmm. they reclaimed the timber and made this beautifully handcrafted coffee table. Uh -huh. Similarly, we have our office office um, signage in the entryway. Same thing, reclaimed material. Here you can see our one of our conference rooms. Well, you can see it in this picture there, too. In the background, right? Yeah, the maybe can we room. go back to slide one, right? Yes, so I you, see. You mm -hmm. can see the um, full height glass walls. And that allow, and we have that not only in our conference rooms, but also for our attorney offices, 
which is fairly unique. Not a lot of lawyers are comfortable with a glass office, but we wanted to have daylight extend through to the interior spaces, which reduces energy because you don't need to have as many lights on. And it makes for a better work environment for the staff that are outside of the offices. So it does. One. Is there a question, though, as far as uh, confidentiality, for instance, meetings that people may not want to necessarily know that uh, well, we do have in, we have in our conference rooms shades that can be pulled down if necessary. Okay. But because they're enclosed with doors, the conference rooms typically most clients feel comfortable with that and don't need the shades pulled down. Uh, and I know we can't see it from the slide, but is there a, a unique characteristics to temperature control? And in... yes, we do. We also um, made sure that we incorporated temperature controls. We incorporated. Also, lighting controls. Both, both of those things are important to saving energy. And in fact, because of the energy saving techniques that we used, we were able to reduce our energy use by 47% in the first year, even though the space was larger than where we came from. So it was quite dramatic. So your old space, and when did you actually move to your new space? It was in 2000, uh, 2014. So you built it out mm -hmm. to your specifications with all of the lead um, requirements to, mm -hmm. to achieve the gold status. So the building before, even though the space was smaller, you had a 47% higher energy cost? In the old space. In the old space. Right. Oh, and in the old space, we had already undertaken some energy conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. But when you do a complete fit out, there's so much more that you can do. And so we made sure that we did that. And we achieved those energy savings, which results in cost savings. And here's actually some other examples of energy saving is we have lighting controls. So the lighting's in our conference room will turn off when it's not in use. Um, even Automatically? Our Automatically. I mm -hmm. see. So it senses body presence or not. Occupancy sensor. Occupancy. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh -huh. Even our vending machines have sensors on them so that the lighting will go off and the cooling compressor will be put into sleep mode when it's not in use and in off hours. So the cooling compressant, does that affect the temperature then? So it'll turn it off when it's not in use and then come back on. So it maintains the, the sodas and water in a cold temperature, uh -huh. but it's not overused. It's just not on constantly, which I is see. more typical. Right. And then, of course, on weekends when it wouldn't be used very much at all, it's mm -hmm. saving energy. Right. Okay. Any right. other? And low um, uh, water conservation measures, uh -huh. low flow fixtures, plumbing fixtures, and we were able to save think about a um, little over 30% water savings mm -hmm. in our new space as compared to our old space. And mm -hmm. we did go ahead and re, uh, retrofit a core building restroom that isn't in our space, but we wanted to do that anyway. So we got some extra environmental benefit out of it. How many floors are you on in your building? There are nine floors. You have nine floors? Yes. And actually, if you go to slide two, you can see a picture of the building. We saw a picture of the building, right, okay. with the beautiful foliage. Right. Do you have all nine floors of that? No, building? we're only on the, right now we're on the ninth floor and we only have a portion oh. of that. I so see. the whole building is not LEED certified, it's just our space. But there's certain building components you need to make sure you have in, even, in order to go through that program. I see. But how many square feet do you have to cover? I don't know what the number is on it, but I can get back to you on that. <laughs> okay, we'll have another show. Okay. Um, what about um, in terms of sustainability? Uh, recycling or reducing paper waste, mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Well, every attorney has recycling bin right at their desk. We have defaulted all printers to double-sided, and so everybody's expected to use double-sided unless there's some reason not to, so as to save more paper, save more trees, and save costs as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for all of our meetings, we use actual plates, cups, glasses that are then put in a dishwasher so that we're not you know, generating lots of uh, paper plate waste. Mm -hmm. We use water in pitchers rather than bottled water. So there's actually many, many things that we do in our firm sustainability practices. And we actually try to share those with others in terms of engaging the community, engaging our clients, so that everybody can benefit from what we've learned, what works, and what doesn't. Um, so do you have a newsletter that covers these on a regular So I don't have a newsletter, <laughs> but I actually put together a sustainability directors roundtable. So invited sustainability directors and managers from our clients and then other folks in the community to come in, share ideas, what works, best practices, what they've had trouble with. And it was across all different sectors so that somebody 
might have an idea about something that the zoo was doing. And they would have never reached out to the zoo. But having just a conversation, they think, oh, you know, I've got something like that. And perhaps I can incorporate it into my, you know, real estate management practice. So I know you do a lot of writing. So you do have regular uh, column or publish in certain locations where people can read about different developments and issues and so we do problems. have client alerts that um, anyone can subscribe to and then we do also write for the legal intelligencer in Philadelphia and how do we writing. get to that client alert you can go to our website at which is uh, at, yeah. uh, www dot manco dot com m a n k o g o l d dot com and also if you put up slide six we'll see this what we also did was put together a case study and a tour book that shows a lot of what we did and explains how and why for people that may be interested in seeing what they can do to make their offices more sustainable. Aha. Uh -huh. So is that what we're looking so at right now? So that the picture in the center is the cover of the tour book. And then down on the bottom right is the case study. Um, the tour book has all the pretty pictures. The case study's got more detail. So the tour book of your offices mm -hmm. and how it developed and all the specifications. That's right. Ah. That's right. And this is available online? It is on our website. So mm -hmm. you can just go to our website and under practice areas you can click on sustainability and right there you can click either case study or tour book. So how have you taken these different um, uh, skill sets and um, practices to your own personal living space? <laughs> So I drive a hybrid vehicle. <laughs> Very good. And we do try to, I mean, at home, you know, reduce waste, try to buy things with less packaging, try to recycle, right? Because it's good to recycle, but it's better to generate less waste in the first place. Um, you know, my son actually has a whole aquaponics system going in the backyard so that we can grow some of our own herbs and uses the fish for the nutrients. So. You know, little things that people can even do at home, in addition to, you know, a big sustainability program at a business. Right. Well, we only have a few more seconds. And so just quickly, how have you found Hawaii in terms of uh, adjusting and accommodating sustainability and, and where it's going? Well, I think Hawaii is um, very far ahead in terms of the general population understanding and embracing it and really trying to do things to advance sustainability. I don't know if that's the case in the business industry yet. Um, I haven't seen as many businesses having LEED certified buildings, but certainly there are some, and I've met some folks that have them. So um, I think that there's further that people can go, but I think they have the knowledge base and the spirit and the desire to make it happen. So I'm really excited to be here. Great. Well, on that note, Brenda, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on Making Leadership Work. Uh, talking about cross-country law practices, the way of the future, and how one person very successfully, Brenda Katanda, has been able to man manage a 5,000-mile distance uh, in a very important and busy practice, and yet living here in beautiful Hawaii and uh, bringing her skill set to uh, our state. So thank you so much. This is Carol Mon Lee with Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.